We read this morning, Lord's Day 36 and 37. Uh, question 99. What is required in the third commandment, that we, not only by cursing or perjury, but also by rash swearing, must not profane or abuse the name of God, nor by silence or connivance be partakers of these horrible sins in others. And briefly, that we use the holy name of God no other than with fear and reverence, so that he may be rightly confessed and worshipped by us, and be glorified in all our words and works. Is then the profaning of God's name by swearing and cursing so heinous a sin that his wrath is kindled against those who do not endeavor as much as in them lies to prevent and forbid such cursing and swearing? It undoubtedly is, for there is no sin greater or more provoking to God than the profaning of his name. Therefore he has commanded this sin to be punished with death. May we then swear religiously by the name of God? Yes, either when the magistrates demand it of the subjects, or when necessity requires us thereby to confirm finality and truth to the glory of God and the safety of our neighbour. For such an oath is founded on God's word, and therefore was justly used by the saints, both in the Old and New Testament. May we also swear by saints or any other creatures, no, for a lawful oath is calling upon God as the only one who knows the heart that he will bear witness to the truth and punish me if I swear falsely, which honor is due to no creature. Beloved, the third commandment concerns our attitude to God and to his worship. The first commandment is we worship God alone. The second commandment is we worship God only as he has commanded us. And the third commandment is we worship God with the proper reverence and awe. And this commandment is very commonly broken in our society. If you walk down the street of Limerick or any city, in Ireland or even in the Western world, and you will hear God's name being taken in vain. But we must not imagine that they, the ungodly world, are the only people who profane God's name and who break this commandment. We hear them breaking this commandment, and it grieves us in our hearts. Indeed, it should grieve us in our hearts. But we must never approach the Ten Commandments of God's law with the attitude of the Pharisee who says, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. They break this commandment, they curse and swear by the name of God, but I am guiltless when it comes to this commandment. We must see, as we approach this commandment and all the commandments of God's law that we too are guilty of taking God's name in vain. And that's why we must hear the commandments often. They must be preached regularly to remind us of what God's law says and to remind us too of how we are to learn to live in thankfulness to this God who has redeemed us from all of our misery and given unto us eternal life through Jesus Christ. Consider then, honouring God's name. Honouring God's name. Notice first the glorious name, then the proper use of that name, and finally the wicked profanation of that name. The holy name of God is the revelation of who God is. Our names are not like that. Our names do not tell us, or you, very much about the bearer of that name. They are simply labels which serve to identify us and distinguish us from other people. But God's name has meaning. God's name is different, therefore, from our name. 
God gives us this name to reveal to us who he is in his very being. And without the name of God, we would not be able to know God. Just imagine for a moment trying to form a prayer in which you cannot use any of the names of God. You can't say God. You can't say Father. You can't say Lord. You can't say Jehovah. You can't say Almighty. You can't say Holy One. What is your prayer going to be? And how could you have any fellowship with a God if you do not know His name? He would then be this unknowable, far away, distant, glorious being that we could never know. But God gives us His name. He reveals to us His name. And that is a wonderful thing if you think about it for a moment. It shows us that God is a God of covenant fellowship. He says to us, I want you to know my name. Here's my name. I want you to know me. And in knowing me, you will have everlasting life. And in fact, that's the way the Ten Commandments begin. I am the Lord thy God. He reveals, therefore, at the very beginning, this is my name, the Lord, and I am your God. Now behind that name is God himself. The name of God stands for his reputation, his fame, his glory, and that name has substance behind it. It means something that cannot be said about our name. For example, the name God. That speaks of God's strength and power and might. It means the mighty one. The creator who brought all things into being at the beginning according to his almighty power. That's God. The name Lord speaks of God's authority, of God's ownership of all things, of God's sovereign rule over all things. The name Holy One, often he calls himself that in the book of Isaiah, the Holy One of Israel. That speaks of God's spotless purity, his moral excellence, his abhorrence and separation from all sin, and his absolute self-consecration. He is devoted absolutely and entirely to himself and seeks always his own glory. That's the name, Holy One. The name Jehovah speaks of God's eternal unchangeableness and therefore his independence and absolute dependability. You can rely upon this God who is called Jehovah and his faithfulness to his promises. And that name Father, especially revealed in the New Testament, but not exclusively because Malachi talks about him being a father, reveals to us God's love, God's mercy, God's tender-hearted compassion toward his children. But there's more to the name of God than the letters and syllables that make up the word or the words God, Lord, Jehovah, and so on. God's name in scripture is anything by which he makes himself known. Now some in the history of the world have taken this to extremes and have imagined that simply by showing proper reverence to the name, the word, the letters and vials that make up the word Jehovah, if you do that, then you have kept this commandment. That was the Jews' understanding especially as they became more and more apostate. They feared breaking this commandment. They saw, for example, a situation in the wilderness where a man cursed by the name of Jehovah and he was commanded to be put to death. And so to avoid ever using the name Jehovah wrongly, they stopped using the name. They took the consonants for the Hebrew word Jehovah. They took the vowels for the Hebrew word Lord, Adonai, 
And they put them together and they made that the name of God. And so they said, we don't use the holy name of God. It's so awesome, it's so holy, we will not dare take it upon our lips. And in that way they said, we avoid blaspheming the name of God. The modern cultists, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they say that Jehovah is the only true name of God. And all churches that don't use the name Jehovah are false, and that they are the only true people of God because their Bible consistently, so they say, translates the name of God as Jehovah. Whereas other Bibles say Lord, and they say that is a terrible sin against the name of God. But of course, when Jehovah refers to Jesus Christ, suddenly they change their translation to Lord. You must therefore say the JWs use the name, the word Jehovah in your Bibles and in your worship services and in your prayers, otherwise you're taking God's name in vain. But that's not the issue, not the word, not the letters J-E-H-O-V-A-H, that is not some kind of a holy word, it's the content of that word, of that name that is important. Someone might use the word Jehovah often upon his or her lips. He might be a member of the Watchtower Society, the JWs, but he does not confess the name Jehovah simply by saying the word Jehovah. The name Jehovah has substance behind it. Jehovah is the triune God of the Bible. And the Jehovah worshipped by the JWs is not the Jehovah of Scripture. And that's true for other names of God too. Jesus said, for example, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not that which I say? In other words, if I am Lord, you must obey me. And not to obey someone you call Lord is to take the name Lord in vain. And that's what he says, God says in Malachi. If then I be a father, where is my honor? For the Jews to call him father, but not honor him, they were taking that name father in vain. If I be a master, where is my fear? For the Jews to call him master, but not to fear him, that was taking the name of God in vain. And the same is true today with people who say the word God. If by God they do not mean the God of the Bible, the sovereign God of heaven and earth, they are not really confessing the name God, even if they use the word God. And the same applies to Jesus. If the Jesus that a person confesses is not the Jesus of the Bible, the Savior who actually saves his people from their sins, they are not confessing. No matter how much they sing and pray in Jesus' name, they are not confessing the name Jesus. But it goes wider than simply the words Jehovah, Lord, God, and so on. All the names revealed in the Bible. There are many, many names of God revealed in the Bible. But it's wider than that. Because God reveals his name in a variety of ways in the Bible. He puts his name in a variety of places. He puts his name, for example, upon his people so that his people are associated with him. For example, 1 Chronicles 7, 14. My people which are called by my name. And so the Jews in the Old Testament were known as the people called by the name of Jehovah their God and their responsibility was to act in such a way that Jehovah's name would be praised among the heathen. Just as if your children misbehave, it brings dishonor upon your name. Oh, those children from that household, from that family are doing such and such. Those people are terrible people. If your children do good, 
it brings honor upon your name. And if God's children do evil, it brings dishonor upon his name. And if God's children do good, God's name is praised. It's also God put his name in Jerusalem. He put his name upon the temple in Jerusalem. He put his name upon the land of Canaan. And therefore, to profane any part of God's worship, to speak evil of God's city, Jerusalem, or of God's temple in Jerusalem, was to speak evil of the name of God. Because God's name and these places and these things were tied together. They were intimately connected. In Psalm 138, verse 2, we read, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. This, therefore, the Bible is the name of God. And to speak against the Bible is to profane the name of God. When we speak of the name of God, we mean his authority. We mean that which represents him and makes him known in the world. So a prophet comes in the name of God. You must listen to that prophet. You must believe what that prophet says. If you do listen to that prophet, you are listening to God because he comes with all of the authority of God. If you despise that prophet, you despise God because he comes with the authority of God and with the word of God. If you despise the word of God in the scriptures, you despise God himself who gave that word. And Malachi, he brings a charge in Jehovah's name against his people that they have profaned his name. They have despised it and they have profaned it. Remember Malachi is the last of the Old Testament prophets after Israel came back from their captivity in Babylon. They had been there for 70 years and God by a miracle stirred up the heart of Cyrus king of Persia enabling them to go back. They then built the temple again, built the walls of Jerusalem with the help of Nehemiah. And the very last prophet sent to them before the 400 years of darkness would separate the Old Testament from the New Testament and the coming of John the Baptist with the very next prophet. The very last prophet comes with very stark, stark words of criticism and condemnation against the people of God. All was not well in Judah after the exile. They had fallen back into some of their old sins. And one of the sins in which they had fallen was formalism. They went through the motions of worship, but their heart was never really in it. And so the priests especially are accused of despising his name. And they are taken aback and they say, but, but wherein? Wherein have we despised thy name? We have not gone up and down the streets of Jerusalem, cursing and swearing by the name of Jehovah. How have we therefore despised the name of God? And God said, He offered polluted bread upon my altar. That's how they have despised His name. They have polluted His worship. They have offered substandard beasts, the blind, verse 8, and the lame and the sick. They've offered those kind of animals as sacrifices to Jehovah instead of the pure and spotless lambs that they were commanded to offer. They had no reverence for all of the ordinances of the Old Testament worship, all of which pointed to the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ himself. And verse 8, 13 says that they snuffed at God's worship. They turned up their noses at it and they sneered at it. And then they complained that God's worship was a weariness to them. Oh, what a weariness it is. Oh, what a terrible weariness it is for us to have to serve Jehovah God to do all of these things that God has commanded us to do. And God said, all of that is the despising of his name. 
because the worship of the Old Testament church was the way in which God made himself known. It was the revelation of God, of his holiness, of his righteousness, of his mercy, of all of his wonderful attributes were shown in the worship of the Old Testament church. They despised it. They cut corners. They brought wooden things to the temple. And they thought they could just by going through the motions, please God, and God said, no, I reject your vile worship. God, however, loves his name. And he will see to it that his name will be honored. In verse 11 it says, My name shall be great among the Gentiles. And as my name shall be great among the heathen. And verse 14, My name is dreadful among the heathen. And here we have a promise that God will bring into his church the heathen, the Gentiles who have not known his name. And he will gather them from every nation. And his name will therefore be known from the rising of the sun even unto the going down of the sea. In all parts of the world, the name of God will be praised and it will be honored. The Jews are despising it. He's going to reject the Jews. He's going to bring in the Gentiles. And in that way, he will get for himself glory and honor upon his name even when the Jews refuse to glorify and honor his name as they have been called to do. We must, according to the third commandment, we must honor the name of God, and therefore we must honor God himself. And that's set forth positively in our Heidelberg Catechism. Briefly that we use the holy name of God no otherwise than the fear and reverence. We honor and we glorify the name of God. To honor or glorify something means to accord it weight or importance. That's the idea of the Hebrew word glory. It's something heavy. It's something weighty. It's something substantial. It's something important. That's the name of God. And that's why the third commandment says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Because in vain is the opposite of glory, of heavy, and of weighty, and of important. Vanity is the opposite of glory, of weighty. Vanity means meaningless, light, with no substance, worthless, useless, of no consequence. That's vanity. <laughs> and compared to God and God's name, everything is vanity. The entirety of mankind, the entire universe, compared to God and His glory, is vanity. Worthless, useless, of no importance, meaningless. Here's what he says about himself in Isaiah 40, verse 17. All nations, think of that, the proud nations of this world, America, British Isles, Europe, the EU, Africa, all nations of the world before him are as nothing. Nothing. And they are counted to him less than nothing. Less than nothing. And vanity. That's God's estimation of the entire universe in comparison to himself. Nothing. Less than nothing. Vanity. That puts us alone in our faith. God is glorious. His name is glorious. It has faith. It has value, it has importance. His word, the Bible, is glorious and weighty. And compared to this book, which is the book of God, all of the literature that man has produced in the history of the world is vanity, worthless, nothing. God's worship 
is glorious. Compared to all of the activities of all of the men and women and children in the history of the world, all of their great deeds and exploits, the worship of God's name is the most important thing, and all of those other things are worthless, vanity, and nothing. And God's church is glorious. We sang about that in Psalm 48. God's church is glorious because God has put his name there. And compared to the church, all of the society of men, their conferences, their meetings, all the rest, vanity, meaninglessness, nothing. That's how we must view, therefore, God and things associated with God, those things which reveal God to us according to this commandment. We must not lift up God's name unto vanity. That's literally what it says. We must accord it, God's name, honor and glory. We must, not, we must never, therefore, take the name of God for some useless, pointless, or meaningless occasion. God's name must be reserved only for the glorious things, holy and worthy activities. Never make God's name something common or light or unimportant. God's name must be viewed as the most excellent name of all. And compared to God's name, our name must perish in the dust. And some of the names of everyone else you find to be important. God's name. It must be accorded honor and glory. That's the meaning of this third commandment. And that shows us, the high demand of this commandment shows us that we are guilty of breaking this commandment. We use God's name thoughtlessly and without due consideration. And this commandment is actually often broken by God's people. In fact, the wording of the commandment shows us this. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in thee. This command was not directed so much against the Philistines and the Canaanites and so on and so forth. This commandment is directed toward the church, to God's people Israel, and to God's people today, the church. We are the ones who can say, Jehovah is my God. And we are the ones, therefore, who must not be guilty of taking this name in vain. The third commandment is broken peculiarly by those people who have a reputation of being the people of God. They have, or claim to have, the name of God upon them. And Israel was guilty of breaking this commandment time and time again in her history because she brought this honor upon the name of God. And God complained, because of you, my name is blasphemed among the heathen. And today is the same. Because of the scandalous behavior of those who call themselves Christians, God's name is blasphemed among the heathen. That, by the way, explains why the Muslims are so opposed to the West, and why they call it the great Satan. The Muslims, they see the Western world and they say, that's Christianity, because that is a country, a nation, a group of nations which historically has claimed to be a Christian nation. And they see the, the vileness of the way in which people live in the West, and they say, Christianity is a wicked and godless religion, and we are holy followers of Allah. Because God's name, in some sense, is upon the West. Historically, it has been, and the Muslims are able to distinguish between the false church and apostate Christianity and the true church, and so lump them all together under one category and say, if that's Christianity, we want nothing whatsoever to do with that. Hypocrisy among Christians is the most common violation of this commandment among us. The false church, which calls herself church, 
which takes upon herself the name Christian, which might have a billboard outside of her building saying, we are the church of God, or we are the church of Christ. They take God's name in vain. They dare to call themselves after God and after Christ, and all the while they openly deny the word of God and live scandalous lives. And the evangelical world today leads scandalous lives. You do a survey, here's the world, here's their rate of divorce and remarriage. Here's how much abortion goes on in the world on this column. You do a survey, here's the evangelicalism, here are those who claim to be born again. Almost the exact number of divorces, in fact, in some surveys, more divorces than in the world. And a similar number of abortions as well. And you think to yourself, God's name is being blasphemed and taken in vain by all of those people who call themselves Christians who lead scandalous and wicked lives. And the church does not discipline those people and allows them to continue to drag the holy name of God through the mud. We are guilty too. When we pretend to be pious Christians, but do not live as we ought to live, are guilty of hypocrisy if we take the name of God in vain. When we pray to God, or at least make a show of praying to God, but our heart is not really in it, and our mind is all over the place, we are taking God's name in vain. When we come to the worship services, but don't really listen to what's going on, but pretend to be interested in God's worship, we are taking God's name in vain. We don't heed the sermons. We hear them, but don't obey them, we are taking God's name in vain. When we snuff at God's worship and say, Oh, how wearisome it is for me to have to worship God on the Lord's day, and have to drive ourselves to church, we are taking God's name in vain. We must examine ourselves, therefore, and ask ourselves, Are we honoring God's name? In the way in which we live, or are we bringing shame upon the name of God by the way in which we conduct our lives before the ungodly world? The name of God, though, must be used. Some people, we saw that, for example, with the Jews, have stopped using the name of God because they are afraid of being guilty of taking that name in vain. We don't want to take it in vain, therefore we will not take it or use it at all, has been their attitude. But the third commandment commands us to use God's name. And really, it is impossible to be neutral with respect to the name of God. You can't simply ignore God and ignore God's name and say you did not take God's name in vain. Our society is guilty of this third commandment every time they open their mouths and in not mentioning right now their active blaspheming and cursing by the name of God. God's third commandment is broken when men ignore, neglect and slight God's name. For example, the world extols the power of nature but ignores the Creator who brought that nature into being and who sustains that nature by His almighty providence. They are not giving the name of God its honor that it is due. That's done all the time by the media and by the schools. History is taught in the schools. God never gets a mention, even though history is his story, as some have said, 
History is the unfolding of God's eternal purpose. And yet God, who is behind history, never even gets a mention. He's banished from the science classes. He's not mentioned in the literature classes. That's a violation of this third commandment. It's not therefore the opposite of taking God's name in vain is to be silent about God and to never mention him in case you don't use his name properly, but the opposite is actively to glorify him. Either we honor God or we profane and blaspheme him. To profane means to make something common. At the one extreme we have the blasphemer whose mouth is filled with bitterness and cursing against God. At the other extreme we have the man who sings from the heart, How excellent is thy name, O God, in all the earth. And in the middle we have the man who ignores God altogether and does not live as if God existed. And when we live without due consideration of God, without actively seeking to glorify God in all things, we are taking God's name in vain, and we are not doing that which is commanded us in this commandment. The Heidelberg Catechism gives us three ways in which we can positively keep this commandment. We confess God as the one true and living God, we worship God rightly as he has commanded us and pray to him in the name of Jesus Christ. And we glorify God in all of our works and in all of our words. We must live, therefore, beloved, in this consciousness. Everything I do, whether a good work or an evil work, must actually serve the glory of God. Everything I do. Because the world is looking upon me at every moment and saying, Oh, he's a Christian. Look what he did. Look how he lives. If that's what a Christian is, I don't want to be a Christian. We must seek to glorify God in all of our words and in all of our works. We must fear not so much ruining our own reputation, and bringing dishonor upon our own name, that's what the world does. That's why the world doesn't break forth in the terrible sins all of the time, because they think, well, if I did that, if I commit adultery against my wife, then I would be scandal in the community, for example. That curbs the world for a while, but we must say, no, I do not want to bring dishonor upon the name of God, the God who loved me, the God who redeemed me, and the God who preserves me in all of my life. Are we so zealous that we aim everything we do and everything we say at the glory of God's name? That's our keeping of this commandment. The Lord's Day 37 especially addresses a topic which concerns a certain kind of use of God's name. The use of God's name in the swearing of oaths or the making of vows. Now notice the third commandment, according to the teaching of Lord's Day 37, does not forbid all swearing, all taking of oaths, and all making of vows, but it condemns rash swearing, that is, frivolous and unnecessary swearing. It condemns perjury, which is to lie under oath, to say something and swear to it while it is actually a lie. And Lord's Day 37 defends the proper use of oaths by pointing out that these are, according to the Word of God, and were justly used by the saints, believers, in the Old Testament and in the New. When you read the Old Testament especially, look for the formula of an oath. As the Lord liveth, such and such and such. That's an oath. The Lord do to me and more also if. That's 
also you know, they call upon a kind of curse upon you if what you say is false. Or put a person under oath. Joshua said to Achan, Give glory to the Lord God of Israel. And I said, Now confess your sin. Give glory to the Lord God of Israel. He put him under an oath. Jesus Christ himself was put under an oath by the high priest who said, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ. And the Pharisees put the blind man in John 9 under oath. Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. That would have been, of course, a false oath that he had made an oath such as that. But that was the formula for putting someone under an oath. Give God the praise. The idea of an oath is that you're calling God as witness that you are telling the truth. And you're calling God to punish you if what you say is a lie. And if you do not carry out what you promise to do. God swore an oath. Several times, in fact, in the Old Testament, he swore an oath. Hebrews 6 verse 17 tells us he swore an oath. He swore by himself. Because there's no one higher and nothing higher than God. So God swore by himself. And what he says is this. If what I say does not come to pass and is not true, I am not God. That's God swearing a oath. Christ, as we saw, was put under oath in Matthew 26, verse 63. And Christ did not say, hang on a minute, all oaths are unlawful. I will not swear a oath. He didn't say that. He took it seriously, and he confessed before the high priest that, yes, he was the Son of God, and upon his own confession, they condemned him as a blasphemer. Paul swears an oath in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 23. I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. Now our lawful oath must be taken only for very weighty matters because we are calling upon God to confirm what we say is true. Weighty matters would include things the Heidelberg Catechism mentions. When a magistrate requires it, when you go to court and the judge commands you to swear upon the Bible that what you say is true, therefore it's lawful to take an oath. When necessity requires it, when the glory of God and the safety of the neighbor are at stake, then it is lawful to take an oath. But there should be no glib swearing of oaths. Oaths should not be part of your everyday normal conversation. We are not those kind of people who go around saying, I swear, I swear, I swear, for every little thing that comes along. <coughs> but we must not either refuse to swear an oath when it is necessary for some witty reason. In a world of liars, Swearing of oaths is sometimes necessary. But we always swear by the name of God. And that makes the swearing of an oath deadly serious. Now the Heidelberg Catechism was written in a period of theological controversy where the Reformed were opposed by the Lutherans, the Roman Catholics, and the Anabaptists. And that's why they have a whole Lord's Day devoted to this idea and question of oaths. Because the Anabaptists said, all oaths are forbidden. We will not take any oaths. And they appealed to Matthew 5. Today we have not so many Anabaptists around who would say that. The Quakers, for example, would object to oaths. But let's look briefly at Matthew 5 to see what Christ says there about this question of oaths. 
verse 33 to verse 37. Again he hath heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself. That word forswear means break an oath. Thou shalt not break an oath. But shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. For I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Let your conversation be yea, yea, yes, yes, nay, nay, no, no. Your yes should mean yes, and your no should mean no. That's what Jesus says. Whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Which means any addition to your yes, yes, and your no, no comes because of evil. Because we live in a fallen world of liars. And sometimes we need to have an extra guarantee upon the word of a person that what they say is true, their yes or their no is not sufficient. But the point that Jesus is making here, he is in the Sermon of the Mount outlining spiritual principles which are at work in the kingdom of heaven. Christians, this is his point, Christians should be so honest and trustworthy that oaths should not be necessary for a Christian. His yes should be yes. You should be able to rely upon his yes. If he says he's going to do something, you should be able to rely. He will do it, and he will do it in a timely manner, and he will do it exactly as he has promised to do, as much as in him lies. And when he says he will not do something, you should be able to rely upon the fact that he will not do it. Oaths should not be necessary in the kingdom of God. And so the question comes to us in light of this. Can we, as Christians, can we be relied upon to do what we have promised? Are you known as someone whose word is his bond? Who promises to do something and can be relied upon it that he will actually do it? Or are you the kind of person who must be chased up to fulfill your promises? and reminded constantly to do what you said you would do and you're not reliable at all and people just don't find you a trustworthy person and have to get you to swear and to promise before they will actually believe what you say. That's the kind of person, says Jesus, who should not be a citizen in the kingdom of heaven. A citizen in the kingdom of heaven should be a reliable person, an honest person, upright person who doesn't need to swear and make oaths. But Jesus is also at this point exposing the Pharisees' misuse of the law. Throughout Matthew 5 and 6, he has been doing that. They had a view of adultery. He exposed that as false. They had a view about murder. He exposed that as false. They have a view now about the swearing of oaths and Jesus again exposes them as false. Thou shalt not forswear thyself means, as I said, thou shalt not break thy oath. That was the clear word of God. The Pharisees had, however, invented ways in which they could swear to something, make a promise, and then break that promise but they have a legal loophole where they can say, well, that promise was not really valid, and by breaking that promise, I have not actually broken my oath. And so they had a hierarchy of oaths. To swear by the name of God, that's a binding oath. You must keep that oath. But to swear by the temple, that's not a binding oath. You can wriggle yourself out of that oath. 
to swear by the altar, that's not a binding oath, but to swear upon the gift which is upon the altar, that is a binding oath. And in that way, the Pharisees could trick and deceive people and lie and cheat and say they were still keeping their oaths and appear to men to be pious and godly and reliable and honest men, but in reality, they were liars. Jesus says in Matthew 5, no, no, all oaths are binding. There are no legal loopholes which make you say, I have a justification for breaking my promise to you because I only promise on this thing, but not upon that thing. No, all of them. And so he says, if you do not want to be guilty of breaking an oath, don't swear upon anything at all. Don't swear upon heaven, because that's God's throne. And that's a binding oath. Don't swear upon the earth, because that's God's first school, and that's also a binding oath. Don't swear upon Jerusalem, because that is the city of the great king. A binding oath. Don't even swear upon your own head or upon the hairs of your own head, because you don't have the ability or the power to make one of your hairs black or white, and therefore that also is a binding oath. All of your oaths, therefore, are binding. If you make an oath, you better be sure that you're willing to keep that oath. Because there is no loophole as the Pharisees pretended. In fact, like Matthew 23, Jesus criticizes the Pharisees about their foolishness when it comes to making oaths. 23, verse 16. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. That is to say, he is obligated to keep his oath. If he swears by the gold of the temple, but not if he swears by the temple itself. Ye fools and blind, for whether it is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. That's not a binding oath. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon the altar, he is guilty. He is obligated to keep his oath. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it and by all things thereof. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God and by him that sitteth thereof. No legal loopholes, therefore, in these oaths. And the modern equivalent of the pharisaical taking of oaths goes something like this. My word does not count because my fingers were crossed when I made that promise. Or some other equivocation to get around the fact that you made an oath. The lesson is very simple. Swear by God's name when it is necessary. But only when the matter is weighty and important. And only when what you say is true and when you actually intend to do what you have promised, because your words will bind you. And even, as Psalm 15 says, you swear to your hurt. You swear something that you didn't realize was going to obligate you to such a difficult promise, you still do not change your mind and say, well, I didn't think it meant that at the time, and I, I want to get out of that. You know you can't. You're bound by your oath, unless of course it's an unlawful oath, and you have sworn to commit sins. Then of course you're not bound by that oath. But the principle is, you should be so honest that swearing is unnecessary. A man who swears a lot is usually an habitual liar. 
Now we hear God's name taken in vain in our society all the time. It is profane. It is made common. It is dragged through the mud. But notice, the Catechism hardly even deals with that. It's more interested in the blasphemy in which we are complicit. It says that we must not be by silence or connivance partakers of these horrible sins in others. Answer 99, and question 100. His wrath is kindled against those who do not endeavor as much as in them lies to prevent and forbid cursing and swearing. Now, of course, we must never, as Christians, be guilty of these sins, these horrible sins, as the Catechism puts it. We must never be guilty of using the name of God as a swear word. We must never say, oh my God, except when we are praying to God and using that with reverence. Nor may we be like the Pharisees and trying to find a loophole whereby we can commit this sin and not be guilty. We don't say, good heavens, because then we're still taking God's name in vain. We don't say, O oh, hell or O oh, damn, because a Christian does not speak flippantly about hell. Or O oh, gosh, or golly, or my goodness. Or that very well-known abbreviation on the internet today, O-M-G. We all know what O-M-G stands for, and if you don't, ask me after the service. If someone writes OMG, for example, on your Facebook wall, remove it and rebuke that person who wrote it. Our attitude to these sins, when we hear God's name taken in vain, must be horror. We must be grieved, deeply grieved in our heart that someone has taken in vain our God, the God that we love and the God that we serve. I've used it as a swear word. In fact, we should be more offended at that than if someone uses a four-letter word beginning with F in our presence. That's how serious this sin is. If men spoke about your mother in the way in which they dragged God's name through the mud, you would be offended and you would be disgusted and you would rebuke that person to his face and say, how dare you speak about my mother in that way? And all the world, minds may not be guilty of using the word that way, the name of God that way. We must not be guilty either, says the Catechism, of silence or connivance. We must not connive, which means we must not avoid speaking against it, turn a blind eye to it, and therefore be a theater and a better of it. So what must we do then when we hear someone around us take God's name in vain? The third commandment says, defend God's honor. Defend the honor of God's holy name. And beloved, I understand as much as you do that that is difficult. We are naturally afraid of men. And that's our sin because we are afraid more of offending men than of offending God. If you respond in this way, someone takes the name of God in vain, you could say, His name be praised. And in that way, you have shown yourself to be on the side of God. His name be praised. Or you could ask the question I just asked, would you like it if someone used the name of your mother in that way? And that kind of thing will make an ungodly person think. And there's a threat, a terrible threat, that God issues against those who take his name in vain. The Lord will not hold him guiltless, which taketh his name in vain. In other words, the Lord will hold him guilty. And will punish him according to his guilt. And that punishment will be severe. In the Old Testament, the penalty was death. And after death, eternal punishment 
and hell because God loves his neighbors. God does everything to glorify himself and to bring fame upon his name. He destroyed Pharaoh in Egypt, for example, that his name might be praised throughout the earth. Nothing is more important to God than his name. But there's forgiveness for this sin too. As there's forgiveness for all of the sins of God's people when they come and repent of their sin and believe in Jesus Christ. Christ upheld the glory of God's name. Christ is the name of God. He is the full revelation. He is the word of God. He brings to us the knowledge of God. And he came into a world that dishonored God's name. And he honored God's name. That was his meat and drink. To bring glory upon the name of God. And when that meant for him, as it did, that he must die upon the cross to vindicate the glory of God's name, to vindicate God's justice and righteousness, to show forth God's mercy and his love. He was prepared for the sake of the name of God, even to die upon the cross. And now Christ has been given the name which is above every name, and at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And we, we his people, we the children of God, are privileged to live in gratitude to God and to bring glory in all that we say and do in His name. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank Thee for Thy great name which Thou hast revealed to us. We thank Thee that we know Thee and we pray we might be given the courage not to fear men and what they think of us not to fear that our name might be dishonored, but the courage to defend thy name and to glorify thy name, even when it brings dishonor to us and evil consequences upon us. May we be willing to suffer even for the name of our God. For Christ's sake, amen.